Hi guys, Gotham Geek Girl here, and I'm joined by comic historian and author Ken Quarthrow. We're going to discuss his new book, IDW Publishing's Invisible Men, The Trailblazing Black Artists of Comic Books. Thank you so much for joining, Ken. Thank you for having um, me. Yeah, so we're going to discuss uh, what inspired his nonfiction title, his research process, and the importance of sharing these stories. Ken is the author of hundreds of books, magazines, and articles, and he has a huge involvement in comic book history. He was also a historical consultant on a Hollywood film, Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman. He has also provided source material for TV and comic history. And this uh, book is going to tell the story of over a dozen Black artists and their struggles and triumphs in the early years of the industry. In a world that was predominantly occupied by whites, he talks about segregation, the Harlem Renaissance, the Great Depression, and other major events. Uh, the book also contains beautifully illustrated examples of each of the artist's work and many of their contributions. So first, Ken, um, it took you over about 20 years of research and writing for this book? I started on this almost 20 years ago, yeah. It was, wow. uh, it was a long process. But that's extreme dedication. Can you tell us how did you first come up with the concept and why you decided to share these stories? Sure. Um, I've been doing this in the... Uh, writing about comics history and doing research into it for about 50 years, since the early 70s. And uh, I've written, as you said, tons of articles and things like that. But about 20 years ago, I was trying to find information on an artist named Matt Baker, who was uh, one of the premier artists of the Golden Age comics, which is like the 1940s and 50s. And he was probably the best, he's best known for his romance comic work. He was an outstanding artist. He's always one of my favorites, and I wanted to write an article about him. But the problem was at the time that nobody knew anything about Matt Baker. Anybody I had spoken to or any uh, information I could find anywhere, all they knew is that he was black. And many people thought at the time that he was the only black artist ever to work in comics during the 1940s, which always struck me as kind of strange because statistically that didn't even make sense. You know, in the United States, there's only one black artist who worked in comics. But anyway. Uh, after a number of years of asking around and doing my research, I was put in contact with a man named Samuel Joyner, who was a retired black cartoonist living in Philadelphia. And um, I was told that Mr. Joyner had known a lot of these uh, black artists because he started work back in the 1940s. Well, Mr. Joyner had met Matt Baker, and he met uh, several other black artists. And he mentioned them in a, in a long letter that he wrote me after I contacted him. Well, it intrigued me that he knew all these people, but I'd never heard of most of them, which was really strange because I have, like I said, I've been doing this a long time. So one thing led to another, and um, I couldn't find any information on any of these men anywhere in my normal uh, sources that I'd look into, like newspaper archives and libraries and magazines and things like that. So I changed my tactic, and I said, well, what about you uh, trying black newspapers? So I started trying to locate black newspaper archives, which are really are none in the United States. Unfortunately, uh, libraries never kept black newspapers. They would keep the New York Times and you know the Daily News and stuff like that. The black newspapers were just thrown away. But over time, I started finding different little caches of black newspapers, be a, a short run of a few months in one library or a another archive might have another newspaper. And I basically built my own database of these black newspapers. And over time, I started finding information about all these uh, black artists who, even though they were unknown in the white media, were celebrated black artists in the black community. And so the book is basically told from the perspective of black uh, media instead of the traditional white media. And I not only go into uh, the comic career of these men, which in most cases was only a few years, but I can tell the entire story of each one of, there's 18 men in the book. And I tell their life stories, you know, their entire life stories and what they did. And in every case, I also did a lot of genealogical research and I go back generations telling what their families were, you know, leading up to them. In some cases, I go back over 100 years uh, before they were born to tell a, a complete story. 
Yeah, I saw like that definitely gets into their personalities and their, like you said, their triumphs. I saw like um, some people even went as far as having to change their name and changing oh, right. their whole identity. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing what uh, each one of these men is a fascinating story. Naga. It's a, uh, they, each one is unique uh, and each one is in its own way inspiring because what they had to overcome to achieve what they did in their lifetimes. Like I said, the, the comic book aspect of it is an entry point into their lives, but there's so much more to their lives than just a few years they worked in comics. And that's what I tried to get across. Um, how did you go about choosing which artists to include? Was there any? Well, this anyone... is all there is. I mean, this is what I could find. Like I said, I spent 15 years <laughs> uh, following threads of, you know, I would find a little bit of information here and it would lead me to another bit of information over here and, you know, finding connections. A lot of these artists were connected in, in the sense of like they worked together or they knew each other and stuff like that. And I would find uh, a mention of one artist in one article and he would mention another artist and that would lead to another. So like I said, this is a huge process. This is, I don't know, I'm an obsessive researcher, okay, that I go down rabbit holes that, most human beings wouldn't even consider. And, you know, I did that for each one of these men. So it's, it's a pretty comprehensive uh, look at what they had to go through during their lives and the period that they worked in comics. Um, can you tell us about your research process? Uh, you mentioned some uh, like newspapers and right. finding black newspapers. Um, do you have like a favorite way you like to gather information or like well, certain- Like I, I said, I usually start with um, most people, whether you realize it or not, either in the past, they, you have a trail. It's not like it is today where everything's on the internet. You know, in the past, you know, it would, it would be little tiny mentions, like, uh, especially with artists, a lot of times they would have a, 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 an art exhibition or there'd be a, a mention that they, um, they graduated from art school or they won some award or something like that. And I usually build off those little crumbs of information. And I also do genealogical research uh, because they all basically live during a similar time period. And uh, like I said, it, it just, it's tying together a lot of threads. I'm known as the comics detective, okay? If you type in the comics detective on Google, you'll find thousands of articles with my name uh, listed after because that's what I do. It's it's basically detective work is the way I look at it, and it's just finding all these clues and tying them together. It's a long, long, tedious process, but you know you you learn a lot about people. It's amazing. Um, what? Sorry, uh, did you speak with any surviving family members? Did anyone decline, or you have trouble reaching anyone? No. Well, it's it's interesting. Um, all the men I wrote about are, are deceased. The last one died about a year and a half ago, and I never got an opportunity to speak with him. But one of the men I wrote about was named Ezra Jackson, and his daughter is a congresswoman, Sheila Jackson Lee, who's from uh, Texas. She's a very powerful congresswoman. Well, I just found out that last week, matter of fact, just before I got on here, uh, she wants to speak with me about her father which is really interesting, you know, because every year she gives a little speech on Father's Day about her dad uh, and it's put into the congressional record and she mentions his comic book work. So I'll actually have an opportunity to speak with her uh, about her dad and hopefully I'll learn more. Oh, that's great. And um, what were some of the setbacks or difficult challenges that you um, experienced trying to go through this research? Well, it's, the fact that, you know, I couldn't use any of my traditional uh, sources. It's, it's, a, it's really hard to try to build information when, when you don't have a, um, a regular uh, source that you can go back to. Like with the New York Times, many people, you know, there, there's so much you can dig out of like the, the archives of the New York Times or any other newspaper because there's complete runs of it and they're so detailed and everything. But having to use these black uh, sources, there's huge gaps of information that I had to fill in in piecing it all back together. It's, it's almost like doing archaeology. It's, uh, you know, digging up, you know, uh, shards of glass and trying to picture what a, a vase looked like or, you know, 
it, it, it's, it's a lot, a lot of work We're just trying to piece it all together. And like I said, not having normal sources that I usually did to use, I had to totally uh, rearrange my way of thinking. And the book, like I say, is, is reflected basically from a black perspective, which is totally different than almost anything else. You're, I learned, because I read over time thousands of black newspapers and magazines, you learn to see the United States from a, an entirely different perspective because in history we're taught the dominant white perspective way of looking at things. And, you know, I had to totally turn my thinking, you know, around. And as I've told people in many ways, I was you know, ashamed reading it because there's so much I didn't know or was never exposed to because only knowing history from one perspective. This is something, I mean, I wish that there'd be at least a, a semester in every history class in the United States hold from this other perspective because all of us have a lot to learn from each other and learning to take uh, another person's point of view is really helpful. You know, it, it helps us all get along better and it would just make things a whole lot easier if we could all take a wider view of things. Was it the Stone chapter, I think, um, where you went into a little bit about the Harlem Renaissance? I feel like I remember right. you mentioning an article like didn't mention much. Was it the New York Post that was leaving out information? Um, trying to recall. Uh... Well, Elmer Stoner worked during the Harlem Renaissance. He was probably the most important of these black artists because he was like the first one to really, well, he was the first one who, was uh, not ashamed of being black mm -hmm. to uh, work in the industry because prior to him, there was this man named Alphonse Barreau, which, you know, he's the first one in the book. But Alphonse Barreau passed as white and he never admitted to being black and nobody knew he was black. He changed his name, he changed his background. He, he even uh, went as far as, because he was from Charleston, South Carolina, he belonged to the Sons of a Confederacy group and stuff like that. He was very uh, conservative. His son ends up working for Richard Nixon, okay, in the 1970s. His son's still alive right now, and I had to leave him out of the book because of there'd be repercussions if just revealing the fact that he's actually part black, you know. So there, there, there's a lot going on there, you know. But uh, with Elmer Stoner, he was a black man. He had no problem you know, letting everybody know he was black and he worked in the industry. And to me, he was the most important of these artists because he was a well-respected fine artist of the Harlem Renaissance, respected painter. He worked in the white media as illustrator for years, but he also worked in comic books from 1939 up till the late 1950s. And um, he, was, he, was, uh, he served as a conduit for the other uh, black artists who came after him. He got a lot of them jobs and they mentioned that that it was, you know, due to Elmer Stoner getting him, getting them jobs that they even entered the comic book industry. Um, that was actually one of my questions about um, Adolphus uh, crossing the color right. line. Um, you said that not, um, sorry, that some artists not only changed their name for social acceptance, but were considered white passing and were right. rewarded with better opportunities. Um, from your research, did the advantages outweigh the disadvantages for creators that had to make this choice? Well, uh, you know, it's easy for us from our perspective to criticize why somebody would do that. But trying, what I do when I, when I write Nadia is try to look at things again from all different angles. I say, why would somebody do this? Well, uh, he was able to get into Yale, for instance. Yale in, in 1915, when he entered, didn't usually allow blacks, okay? They didn't have an official policy but most blacks, there's only one or two had ever uh, been allowed into Yale. He was able to get into Yale, okay, because he passed as white. He was able to get all these lucrative jobs with, uh, uh, as an illustrator, as a pulp illustrator. He formed his own comic studio, uh, art studio, and stuff like that. And he was a successful artist his entire career. All those opportunities probably wouldn't have been available to him if they'd known he was black. You see what I'm saying? So it's, on one hand, you know, you can be critical, you know, from our perspective, but if you look at it from his perspective, 
you made a, a career of it and you became very successful. So it's, you know, it, it's sort of like, you know, you got to do what you got to do is, is the way I look at it, you know, and um, that's why I, when I present his story in the book, you know, I tell his story, but I don't, I don't, I'm not judgmental about what uh, he did. You know, everybody has to make their own decisions. I think that's why it's great um, how you tie in like decades back, like their parents' generation and what they right. went through and race wars and riots and all exactly. of that that you mentioned, because it really does build into the decisions they made. Right. I've had a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of people write to me about this and uh, even uh, younger black people have written to me and stuff. And they said like, we had no idea about this part of our history and stuff like that. And that, that's, to me, is the most heartening thing, Nadia, because I want people to realize there's so much more to history than what we've been taught, you know, and, and this just opens up another little window, another little aspect of history that needs to be explored. And I just hope that people get that, you know, from this book. I hope that people get a, a, a better understanding of, you know, what, what, what Blacks actually went through during that time period. It's, it's hard for us to conceive of, of you know, the, uh, the systemic racism that they went through. It's one thing to hear about it, but like I said with this book here, you know, I can give example after example after example of what they had to go through. And they, and they endured it, you know, that they actually went through it. That's why there's a thing I talk about in the book. I don't get too deep into this, but uh, it's called, um, they had a dual lives. And uh, this goes back to uh, an essay written in 1903 by W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the first black uh, social activists and everything and, and thinkers. And he wrote about the two lives that blacks had to learn to lead. The, the, uh, the life that they spent in the black community, you know, amongst their neighbors and family and stuff. And then the other world they had to learn to live in, which was the white world. And they're two totally separate worlds. And that's kind of almost startling from our perspective to think of that, you know, as a white person to, uh, to realize that the people would have to have almost like a split personality, you know, to, to deal with, uh, with the systemic racism of the time. But they didn't have a choice. It, it, it wasn't like, you know, they could get on social media and talk about it and, uh, complain about it and things like that. They didn't have a choice. It was just the way things were. And, but each one of these men found ways around it and how to deal with it. And they became successful. Almost every single one of them went on to either become a teacher or a fine artist or a um, social activist and stuff like that. So it, it's inspiring in a lot, a lot of ways. But again, also a couple of them succumbed to other things. Like there's one man in the book named... Um, Alfonso Green, who ended up in, in crime, and he ended up going to jail off and on throughout his, his entire life. And on, in matter of fact, the only photo I ever found of him was a booking photo that I, I was able to find. Yet this man was a very, very talented artist, you know, but, it, you know, he wasn't allowed the same opportunities as if he'd been white. So it's, it's, it's a real uh, eye-opening, uh, you know, history, I think, in a lot of ways for people. Um, in the book, you mentioned a point where some artists didn't sign their name, that um, at a point there was a common practice for publishers and shop owners mm -hmm. to demand anonymity, right. sorry, anonymity of their artists. Did you have any trouble identifying any artworks throughout the process? Well, I've been doing this a long time, and, and, and part of being a, a comic historian and, and just knowing comics is you learn to identify art styles. Uh, most of the things that appear in the book were signed, which you know I, I sought out signed uh, examples of their artwork just so I, I could confirm it mm -hmm. and also to make it easier for people to understand it. Uh, each one of the men in the book has a, a comic book. So we've reprinted a comic book story that they, they did, at least one. So people get an example of the artwork of each one of these men. That's another thing that makes Invisible Men kind of a unique book, that it's not just a textbook. It's visually, we have a ton of images oh, wow. in it and that, you know, and it, 
it's, it makes it a very uh, easy to people engage, you know, each one of these artists. Again, you're not just hearing their stories, you're seeing what these men actually were able to uh, accomplish. And yeah, they, it, part of the tradition of the time was to not sign stories because publishers didn't, they didn't care about the artist at all. The, all they cared about was uh, the product. And the product was, if you did the, the Blue Beetle, for instance, they just wanted the Blue Beetle to come out month after month after month. They didn't want people to identify with a particular person drawing the Blue Beetle. They just wanted the Blue Beetle there all the time. And so anonymity was, was one of the ways that they uh, accomplished that. It wasn't matter if you're white or black. Yeah, that was super interesting to me because I feel like now with comics, it's like it's the artist who draws you. Exactly. The exactly. And, and again, you know, it's it's hard, you know, from the perspective of today to think about what these guys went through. It was a different way of even the way the comic book industry was run, uh, Nadia. Like you said, we identify with the artists today. We think of an artist uh, almost like a star. It was totally different back in those days. They were menial workers. They're getting paid like $2 per page to draw a comic book page. Like I said, I'm, I'm an artist and I started out to be a comic book artist. Well, I had to give it up in the 1970s because I was starved to death doing it. I'm not that fast. And if you're trying to feed a family where you're only getting, you know, $25, $30 a page and you only could do two or three a week, that's not going to cut it. So these guys had to produce work as fast as they could, you know, to just get enough money even to eat. And uh, like I said, it, it was a different world back then. And most of them worked through what was called a comic shop, which was basically a, a comic book packager. He was, a, um, it was a studio owned by one man and he would go to a, a publisher and publishers wouldn't deal with the artists themselves. They would deal with the packager, the, the studio head. And they would say to him, I need two 64 page comic books by next week. I need the material, just get it to me. So the packager would go back, hire as many artists as he needed to hurry up and crank out these two 64 page comics by next week. Well, you're working as fast as you can. And most of the art was really crappy. You know, it was uh, done a lot of times by kids who could barely draw, kids were hired off the street. What the advantage for black artists was, is that a lot of times they could go to the comic packager, get the assignment, then go home and draw it. And they didn't have to work in the studio with the other artists. But consequently, what happened is a lot of the white artists who were in the studios never even met the black artists who were also working. Again, that's why I called the book Invisible Men. They're even invisible to their uh, white co-workers. Because I've interviewed some, a lot of uh, white uh, artists from that time period. Like I said, I've been doing this a lot of years. And most of them have never met a black comic book artist during that period. But the reason was, is because they physically would not even be in the studio. It's just so weird to even think about stuff like that. They, you know, they, there was that buffer that they, you know, they couldn't cross. Like I say, Nadia, there, there's, it, it's, it's, it, uh, it's a, learning experience when you know reading all this stuff and, and you know finding it out it was embarrassing to me i have to say that yeah you, you mentioned so many names i i've never heard of oh yeah i know i, I said <laughs> <laughs> it I'm was sorry. Like, so impressive like your research was amazing um well, why is it so important to share these stories and how do you feel about the industry and representation now well, I think it's important because, again, I think history just in general is important. That, that's just the way I feel. It's the old uh, Santayana uh, uh, axiom about, you know, if we're doomed to repeat history, you know, if we don't learn from it. And uh, I just think knowing our history is better for all of us. And, you know, and we have one history here you know, in this country, we have a tendency to look at things from one perspective, but it's, it's much wider than it is. Like this is Black History Month, but even some of the, uh, uh, I've talked to several black historians and, they, and that really irritates them that there's only one month devoted to black history because they say like history 
is, you know, they, they don't do it to anybody else. It's just like, you know, why is there a Black History Month? You know, Black history is everywhere. You know, they touch every aspect of, of American history. And that's why I think a book like this is important, why I think it was important for me to, you know, write this book. As far as like the industry nowadays, I've thought about that. I, I assume, you know, because I don't work in it, that, you know, opportunities are, are much more than they ever were, you know. And, uh, but I, I can't speak to it directly because obviously I'm not black and I'm, you know, I'm not a, a, a present day comic book artist. But uh, I just think the opportunities for any individual nowadays are more easily uh, accomplished in comics than they were before. You know, in uh, comics have a much higher level of, of acceptance than they did, you know, 80 years ago, uh, where they used to be considered the lowest rung of uh, publishing. And you get some very, very talented people of every race, uh, you know, into comics now, people who at one time never would even have thought about working in comics. But um, I just think it's important, again, that everybody knows our history. And like I say, my, my, uh, my realm of uh, history is comic books. But I also tried to expand it and show that comic books are just are also a part of the whole wider macro version of history. It's not something exclusive unto itself. It's all part of the whole scheme. Which was um, and one of the artists I remember was it the blue? What one of the artists you mentioned like a racist uh, um, ah like character in Captain Marvel. That was um, like a well, character Owen that... Mid well, Owen Middleton worked uh, for Fawcett, the company that did Captain Marvel, but, but what were you asking exactly? Um, I remember like, uh, I'm trying to remember which chapter where there was a character that was removed or wanted to be removed. Well, well, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that was, that was accomplished actually by a group of kids. I believe they're from New York City. I think they're from Brooklyn, if I'm not mistaken. And what it was is there used to be a character in Captain Marvel comics. His name was Steamboat. And he was a black character. And it was the most racist depiction of, of a black you could imagine. I don't know if you've ever seen any other comics of the 30s and 40s and 20s and stuff like that, where it's, it's he almost looks like an ape. Okay, I, it's, it's, if, you, if I showed you the character, I, I don't have a picture of it right here you could see how offensive this character was. Well, this uh, group of uh, kids from New York City, um, okay, this group of kids from New York City got together and um, they formed their own little group and they went down to the publisher, which was Fawcett in New York City. And they talked to the publisher directly and they told him how offensive they thought this character was. And so, you know, he thought about it and he says, you're right, you know, totally right. So they just totally got rid of the character right then. But that was only one of many offensive black characters that were done at the time. And um, it changed somewhat after World War II, but not hugely. I mean, there's one of the things I read about in the book is uh, Matt Baker created a character called Vooda, V-O-O-D-A-H, which is the first black hero to have his own uh, uh, feature in a mainstream white comic book. It was in 1945. Well, Vuda was like a Tarzan type character, except he was black. There was a lot of Tarzan type characters in comic books at the time, but they're always white, where this white jungle god goes and saves, you know, the black natives and all that stuff. Well, he was black, and there was no doubt about it. You know, it, that's the way Matt Baker drew him. Well, the interesting thing was, Nadia, on the comic book cover, they would show Vuda is white, but on the interior, he was black. And the reason why that was is because a lot of retailers, particularly in the South, wouldn't put a comic book on the stands that had a, a positive black character on the front. So they would depict him as white on the cover and black on the interior of the comic. And then six issues in, they actually changed the color of him inside to white as well because they were getting complaints. I mean, it's, it's so many things like that, you know, I came across again and again and again, that it's, 
it's almost chilling in a way, you know, to, to read this kind of stuff, but that's the way it was, you know. And um, anything else you'd like to share, Ken, that we didn't mention? No, I hope people buy the book. Uh, like I say, yeah, I, I'm getting a lot of uh, uh, attention about it, but I, I feel better the fact that it's just that it's bringing up some history that I think a lot of people should learn, and I feel good about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see about your upcoming interview with the daughter. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it, the thing is, is that it's being set up by the Library of Congress. They contacted me. The head, the head librarian of the Library of Congress is a fan of my book. And she's going to sit in on this uh, interview. So it's going to be me, this congresswoman, and the head librarian of the Library of Congress. And supposedly we're going to film it. So there's a good chance we'll end up being online pretty soon. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ken. This has been great. Um, I love your book, and I really well, hope you. more people read it. Well, I do too. Well, thank you very much, Nadia. I appreciate you having me on.